Hypertension, or high blood pressure, affects over a billion people around the world. Now, normal systolic blood pressure is defined as less than 120 mm of mercury, and normal diastolic pressure is less than 80 mm of mercury. Prehypertension is when systolic blood pressure is between 120 and 129 mm of mercury, and less than 80 mm of mercury on the diastolic side. Stage 1 hypertension is between 130 and 139 mm of mercury on the systolic side, and between 80 and 89 mm of mercury on the diastolic side. Stage 2 hypertension is defined as anything that is 140 mm of mercury or higher on the systolic side, and 90 mm of mercury or higher on the diastolic side. Typically, both systolic and diastolic pressures tend to rise or fall together, but that's not always the case. Sometimes you can have systolic or diastolic hypertension when one number is normal and the other is really high. This is referred to as isolated systolic hypertension or isolated diastolic hypertension. There are two main types of blood pressure measurements. Office blood pressure, which is taken in a clinic, emergency department or hospital, and out-of-office blood pressure. The out-of-office blood pressure is either a home blood pressure, which is taken by the patient at home, or an ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, or ABMP, which involves 24-hour monitoring of blood pressure as the patients live their normal daily life and while they sleep, to see if their blood pressure falls at night compared to during the day. It uses a small digital blood pressure machine that's attached to a belt around the body and it's connected to a cuff around the upper arm. Ambulatory blood pressure monitoring is the best way to diagnose hypertension, but it's not always feasible, so it's usually done when office and home blood pressure measurements are really discordant from one another. Now, the first step for an office blood pressure is to make sure that the patient has rested for at least five minutes and is positioned properly, sitting with their arms and back supported and their feet flat on the floor. And the measurement should be repeated at least twice. Most of the time, blood pressure is taken in the brachial artery in the upper arm, because if the pressure is high there, it's probably high throughout the arteries. And keep in mind that just being in the office can cause blood pressure to change. In white coat hypertension, a person's blood pressure rises, and in masked hypertension, a person's blood pressure falls. So the diagnosis of hypertension should be done by looking at both office and out-of-office blood pressure measurements. The second step is taking the patient's history and physical examination. Now, there are two main types of hypertension. Primary, or essential hypertension, has no clearly identifiable underlying reason, and secondary hypertension, which does have a specific identifiable underlying condition. Primary hypertension is way more common, and it generally isn't accompanied by symptoms. It's sometimes called a silent killer, because over time, pressure in the arteries slightly creeps up and causes blood vessel damage, which is a risk factor for serious problems, like myocardial infarctions, aneurysms and strokes. Risk factors for primary hypertension include old age, obesity, family history, a salt-heavy diet, a sedentary lifestyle, heavy alcohol consumption, smoking, and race. For example, people of African descent are more likely to develop hypertension. And some of these risk factors can be improved with lifestyle changes that help to reduce hypertension. Now, secondary hypertension often is accompanied by a variety of symptoms associated with the underlying cause. In general, the younger the patient, the more likely it's secondary hypertension. For example, Anything that limits the renal blood flow can cause hypertension, like fibromuscular dysplasia, which generally affects young women, but also atherosclerosis in older patients. Other examples include obstructive sleep apnea, vasculitis or aortic dissection, as well as pheochromocytoma, Cushing syndrome and other endocrine disorders. It's also important to identify signs of end organ damage and whether the patient takes any medications or exogenous substances that can worsen hypertension sympathomimetic agents like decongestants or even cocaine, cyclosporin or tacrolimus, sodium-containing antacids, stimulants like amphetamines, atypical antipsychotics like clozapine, antidepressants, oral contraceptives, erythropoietin and even NSAIDs and licorice, that delicious chewy black candy. A basal metabolic panel and electrocardiography should be performed to screen for secondary forms of hypertension. Management for hypertension is mainly based on the hypertension stage, risk of developing cardiovascular events and organ damage, as well as taking into account any concomitant diseases, such as diabetes or chronic kidney disease. Lifestyle changes are crucial for all patients, especially in the long term, and include things like quitting smoking, drinking alcohol in moderation, and maintaining a healthy weight, 
reducing dietary sodium, and staying physically active. Not all patients with hypertension need antihypertensive drug therapy. In fact, medication is generally suggested for only patients with out-of-office daytime blood pressures higher than 135 mm of mercury systolic or higher than 85 mm of mercury diastolic or an average office blood pressure of higher than 140 over 90 mm of mercury if out-of-office readings aren't available. It's also recommended for patients with an out-of-office blood pressure of higher than 130 mm of mercury systolic or 80 mm of mercury diastolic, or, if out-of-office readings are unavailable, an average office blood pressure higher than 130 mm of mercury systolic or 80 mm of mercury diastolic, who also have other features. Specifically, they need to have at least one of the following. Cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes mellitus, chronic kidney disease, be over 65 years old, or have an elevated risk of coronary artery disease. On the flip side, it's generally recommended not to give an antihypertensive medication to patients with stage 1 hypertension and are either over 75 years old or have no organ damage. There are four main classes of medications that are used to treat hypertension. ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers or ARBs, thiazide diuretics, and long-acting calcium channel blockers like dihydropyridine. There is a lot of variability in terms of how individuals respond to different medications, so it's important to follow up to see how the medications are working. Usually, therapy begins by choosing one medication. Broadly speaking, ACE inhibitors are started in patients at high risk for coronary artery disease, including those with a prior STEMI, heart failure, asymptomatic left ventricular dysfunction, diabetes and chronic kidney disease. A common side effect of ACE inhibitors is chronic cough, so ARBs are often started in patients who don't tolerate ACE inhibitors, mostly because of the cough. Thiazide diuretics and calcium channel blockers show very similar efficacy to ACE inhibitors, and they're first-line therapy in patients of African descent. But diuretics have a lot of metabolic effects, so they can't be given to patients with high blood glucose and cholesterol levels. The blood pressure goal, while on medications, varies based on the initial blood pressure, as well as age and other health conditions. But in general, it's ideal to have an out-of-office blood pressure below 135 over 85 mm of mercury and an office blood pressure below 140 over 90 mm of mercury. If the blood pressure isn't improving within a month, then the dose is usually increased or a second medication from a different class is often started. Some combinations are useful, while others aren't. ACE inhibitors and ARBs should not be combined, and instead, either can be combined with a thiazide diuretic or a calcium channel blocker. In some cases, diuretics may be combined with beta blockers. If blood pressure is not kept under control after combining two medications, then an ACE inhibitor or ARB should be combined with both a thiazide diuretic and a calcium channel blocker. If a thiazide diuretic isn't well tolerated or is contraindicated, for instance in patients with metabolic conditions, then a mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, like spironolactone or eplerinone, can be used instead. And if those medications also can't be used because it isn't well tolerated or is contraindicated, then a beta blocker can be used. If the blood pressure isn't controlled with a combination of three antihypertensive medications, including a diuretic, then it's considered drug-resistant hypertension. Often, patients with hypertension feel pretty well and forget to take their hypertension medications. That's why regimens of daily pills have got better medication adherence as compared to twice-daily pills. In fact, when there's a patient with drug-resistant hypertension, it's important to confirm that they are actually taking the medication. Finally, if the blood pressure gets really high really fast, it's called a hypertensive crisis. In hypertensive crisis, either the systolic pressure is greater than 180 mm of mercury, or the diastolic pressure is greater than 120 mm of mercury. Hypertensive crisis can be further split into hypertensive urgency and hypertensive emergency. With hypertensive urgency, there hasn't yet been damage to end organs like the brain, kidneys, heart and lungs. In hypertensive emergency, there is damage to end organs, and patients have symptoms like confusion, drowsiness, chest pain and dyspnea. The most common cause of hypertensive crisis is not taking antihypertensive medications, but it can also be due to causes of secondary hypertension, like renovascular disease, pheochromocytoma, hyperaldosteronism, and erythropoietin intake. For treatment, it's important to gradually reduce the blood pressure over one to two days to make sure that the brain never gets underperfused. Treatment of hypertensive urgency is done with oral medications like ACE inhibitors, 
On the other hand, in a hypertensive emergency, the goal is to lower the mean arterial pressure by 20% within the first hour, and treatment is given intravenously with medications like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers and vasodilators, like nitroprusside and nitroglycerin. Alright, as a quick recap, stage 1 hypertension is defined as 130 to 139 mm of mercury for the systolic blood pressure and between 80 to 89 mm of mercury for the diastolic pressure while stage 2 hypertension is defined as greater than 140 mm of mercury on the systolic side and greater than 90 mm of mercury on the diastolic side. Hypertension usually doesn't cause any symptoms, and the first line of treatment is lifestyle changes, like changes to the diet, exercise and stress reduction. In addition, drug therapy may be given to patients with really high blood pressure or risk of adverse events. The four main medication classes used are ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers or ARBs, thiazide diuretics and long-acting calcium channel blockers like dihydropyridine. 